Okay, so now we're going to go into the text of the Mangala Sutta. The Mangala Sutta occurs, you can see from the reference that it occurs in the Sutta Nipata. It's the second chapter, the fourth sutta. And it also occurs in a little collection called the Kudaka Pata, also in the Pali Canon. Could you check if the HDMI is plugged in all the way? The HDMI cable mm -hmm. is plugged in all the way. Okay. okay. Okay, so the sutta begins when the Buddha was living near the city of Savati at the monastery called Jeta's Grove that had been donated to him by the philanthropist Anatta Pindika. Okay, then the text says that when the night was far advanced, a certain deity, Deva, approached the Buddha, saluted him, and stood to one side. Okay, what is going on here? Okay, it's, it's said that during the day, the Buddha would spend his time mostly teaching people, going, going on alms round in the morning, taking his meal, then in the afternoon, spending part of the afternoon in meditation, in the early evening, lay people would come to the monastery and he would give a discourse. Then in the early part of the evening, he would give instructions to the monks and again go into meditation for some period. Then in the depths of the night, when everybody else is asleep, that would be the time for the devas to come to approach the Buddha to ask questions. Now the devas is the, that's the word that we translate as deities. So these are not gods in the sense of polytheistic gods, gods who control processes of nature. But they are beings who have done wholesome karma, meritorious deeds, and they've been reborn in various celestial planes. And the Buddha is a human being, but because of his spiritual status, as being the fully enlightened one, the perfectly enlightened one. He's also known as Satta Deva Manusana. He's the teacher of deities and human beings. And so the deities too are beings who are still in bondage to samsara, the round of birth and death. They're still in need of instruction. And the one, those deities who are wise, the one that they turn to for instruction is the Buddha. And so during this period, in the depths of the night, when everyone else is asleep, when the town is quiet, the monastery is quiet, then the devas are usually hesitant to come to the human world during the day. But when everything is quiet, then they see that it's a safe time to come to visit the Buddha. And so on this occasion it's said that a particular deity had come to the Buddha in order to ask a question. And just like Shakespeare said, when troubles come, they come not single-handed but in battalions. <laughs> so it's said that when deities come to see the Buddha, they don't come just one at a time, but usually one deity will be at the head of a whole multitude of deities. And so according to the commentary, that was what happened in this case. So one deity was selected to ask the question, but he came along with a whole pedalion of <laughs> other deities behind him. And so this deity comes to the Buddha, and even the deities, the devas, they bow down to the Buddha out of respect. And then he addressed the Buddha in a verse. And then we can recite the verses together, both in Pali and in English. And again, I will do it phrase by phrase. Okay. Bahu Deva Manusacha 
Mangalani Achintayu Mangalani Achintayu Akankamana Sotanu Akankamana Sotanu Brohi Mangala Muttama Brohi Mangala Muttama Okay, then the translation Many deities and human beings Many deities and human beings Longing for happiness and well-being Longing for happiness and well-being Have pondered on blessings Have pondered on blessings Tell me what the highest blessings are Tell me what the highest blessings are Okay, now again this is sort of the background explanation and the commentary In India at that time there had been a lot of discussion about what is the source of true blessings. And I don't know, is there anybody here from a Brahminic background? In India? <laughs> okay, so the Brahmins have many ideas about what constitutes blessings. And so some say that there are certain lucky sights that when you step out of your house in the morning, if you see a particular kind of bird flying by, that is a sign of good luck. Um, if a certain kind of flower blossoms on a tree outside your house, that is a sign of good luck. If you hear the song of a particular bird as soon as you step out in the morning, that is a sign of good luck. So all of these are taken to be mangalas signs of good luck, signs of good fortune. And so there was this great, a lot of discussions and debates going on amongst the people of India in the Buddha's time. And then those, the, the, the deities who were sort of above the human world were listening in and they heard these debates and they started to have discussions amongst themselves. What is the source of the greatest blessing? What is it that contributes to the highest happiness. <laughs> and so finally the deities thought that we have to resolve this problem. And so who is the one who is going to be able to tell us what is true blessing, the way to true happiness? And then they realized that it wasn't amongst themselves in the heavenly world that they could solve the problem, but the one who could answer the question for them was in the human world. That is the Buddha himself. Okay, so they chose one of their number to be the representative, and then in a group they came down and appeared before the Buddha, and then in the presence of the Buddha, then they presented him with this request, please tell us what is the highest blessing. Okay, so this is the opening of the Sutta. And now the Buddha doesn't begin right away. He doesn't say, okay, you're asking me about the highest blessing. The highest blessing is the liberation that comes from arhats, from the attainment of enlightenment, the achievement of arhatship. This is the noble eightfold path to arhatship. You just follow that and that's the answer to your question. But rather, as I explained last night, the Buddha proceeds in a kind of sequential, graded method, starting from the beginning point and then working step by step through all of the different aspects of human life until he'll come at the end to what is the truly the ultimate highest blessing. And so he begins with the verse, and last night in my scheme that I called the ground plan for the Mangala Sutta, I called this the stage of orientation. So again, let's recite the verse in Pali and in English, and we'll elaborate on it. Asevana Chabhalanam Asevana Chabhalanam Panditanam Chasevana 
Pujacha Pujaniyam Pujacha Pujaniyam Etam Mangala Muttamam Etam Mangala Muttamam And the translation, not to associate with the foolish. Not to associate with the foolish. But to associate with the wise. But to associate with the wise. And to honor those worthy of honor. And to honor those worthy of honor. This is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Okay, so why does the Buddha start off with this particular step as sort of the starting point, the foundation for the unfolding of the whole sequence of blessings. This is because the Buddha again and again, when one reads the suttas, one sees again and again, he emphasizes the importance of right association avoiding wrong association, harmful association, and establishing right association. And we need this particularly when we're starting off in the spiritual life because our minds are somewhat like, you know that lizard that's called Chameleon? Chameleon? Do I get the right pronunciation? <laughs> okay. It's a kind of lizard that can change its color according to its background. So if this lizard is up against, if it's resting against the bark of a tree, its skin will turn brown. If it's amidst the grass for a long period of time, its skin will turn green. I guess if it goes on red earth, the earth the skin will turn red. So the skin, the color of the skin changes to match its environment. So the skin is very changeable in color. And similarly, our own minds are very, very, we say, fickle, unreliable, unsteady, and they change according to the people that we associate with. So like we don't exist in each one of us with kind of fixed, absolutely predetermined character. But our characters, our dispositions, are very much influenced by the people that we associate with. And we could just say, you know, if you just think about different groups of people that you associate with, you'll see how your mind changes according to the people that you're associated with. Yeah, I remember years ago when I was living as a monk in Sri Lanka, there was a particular monk who was stay, staying with us at the, at the hermitage where I was living. And this monk would always be criticizing other monks. <laughs> okay, so if a monk came to the temple, you know, we have like, robes of different shades of color. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the robes are sort of a bright orange. So if a monk came to stay for a few days at our monastery, he was wearing a bright orange robe, he would be complaining to me. <laughs> monk shouldn't be wearing bright orange robes. <laughs> it's not really suitable for a renunciate. <laughs> if he wants to, to wear bright colors, he should just throw. <laughs> <laughs> and he can buy clothes of any colors he wants. But then a, a monk would come to the monastery wearing some of the more ascetic monks would wear these very darkish robes, almost like a kind of somewhere between a maroon and a brown. And so if a monk would come wearing that kind of robe, he would take me aside and complain. <laughs> you know, monks who were wearing those kind of robes are showing off. <laughs> They're trying to impress everybody. 
to make people know that they're forest-dwelling ascetics. <laughs> they should wear robes more like this color. <laughs> if the monk would go a few days not shave, not shaving, and not shaving the hair, he'd say, I don't like monks who don't shave. <laughs> if the monk shaves every day, <laughs> then he would complain, why is that monk shaving every day? <laughs> Okay, what I found when I was getting friendly with him, my mind started to look at the faults of everybody's faults. <laughs> Every little fault was sort of now was like coming under a magnifying glass. Like usually we would just, you know, pass over these things. You know, they're very trivial things. They're not even faults in their own right. But now suddenly I'm seeing everything, everybody around me is doing something wrong. So I realized I have to keep sort of a little step back and keep a little bit of a distance from that person. Yeah, so this is just an example of how the human mind works. And so the Buddha, again and again, he stresses this importance of, he calls it Kalyana Mitata good friendship. And in the suttas he explains how one trains a wild elephant. Does anybody have any experience training elephants? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we see them on the streets? <laughs> and when some years ago my sister and her niece they came to visit me in Sri Lanka and we were I think I was going with them back to the airport <laughs> after their, their stay, and on the road we were stuck behind an <laughs> behind a line of elephants. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked, "What kind of elephants do you have in, true, in America?" <laughs> <laughs> A wild elephant, when they catch a wild elephant, they don't try to train it immediately, but they put it into a confined area with a tamed elephant. And then the wild elephant, by associating with the tamed elephant, sort of when it's first captured and put into this confined area, the elephant is fierce and wild and difficult to it's unable to control itself. But when it stays with the tamed elephant, then it quiets down and becomes more gentle and more approachable. And then the elephant trainers are able to approach it and to train it. And so it's the same in a way with us as human beings. So we would say that our minds are wild, rough, sometimes violent, full of commotion, difficult to tame. So the way to tame our minds, to tame our conduct, is to associate with good people, with wise people. And so in the first instant, the Buddha says, one has to avoid the foolish and associate with the wise. And then that is a way we gradually start to lose our own sort of deeply ingrained foolishness and we start to conduct ourselves and behave like the pandita, the wise ones. Then to elaborate on these points, what I've done under each of the major headings in the sutta, I've collected a number of suttas from various parts of the, especially from the Sutta Bhitaka. And so we can look at some of these passages.
Okay, so the question comes up when you say not to associate with foolish people. So how is one able to determine who is a foolish person, who is a wise person? And so we find, and this is very convenient, very interesting, that if one looks at any of these topics that are treated in the Mangala Sutta just with one word, if one does a search for that word through the Sutta Vitaka, one finds a fair number of suttas that illustrate the meaning of that term. So when it comes to the foolish person, so we find a sutta that speaks about the three characteristics or marks of a fool. Nowadays it's not polite to call somebody a fool, but if we say a foolish person, maybe it's more acceptable. So the foolish person is one who thinks badly, speaks badly, and acts badly. So that is how we can determine who is a foolish person. And probably we're not able to see into the person's mind and to read their mind and know what that person is thinking, but our thoughts manifest through our conduct, through our speech, through our actions. And so when one sees somebody who speaks badly, who speaks glibly, with a lot of nonsense, who denigrates other people, who boasts about themselves, and so on, who acts badly, who steals, who has no hesitation about even killing, from a Buddhist point of view, killing insects and other forms of life. Okay, then one can know that person is a foolish person. Foolish person, that's the kind of person to avoid. And then to determine who is the wise person. Again, the wise person is one who can be known through their good conduct, through their restraint of speech, their good conduct of, with the body. And from this we can infer that they have good mind, good character. Uh, this is a very interesting sutta on how to distinguish a foolish person from a wise person. And this is also a good guide for ourselves for determining how to act. So in this sutta, the Buddha speaks about four kinds of deeds. So there are some things, some deeds, that are disagreeable to do, unpleasant to do, and we know that they'll be harmful to us in the future. Okay, so if a deed is of that kind, disagreeable to do, and it's going to be harmful in the future, then any sensible person would avoid that kind, that kind of deed. First of all, because it's disagreeable, we don't want to do it, and then because of the consequences, it's going to have harmful consequences for us in the future. So we have to reflect before we act what are the consequences, what are the likely consequences of this deed for ourselves. Okay, then comes the deed that is disagreeable to do, but that will prove beneficial. So this is the kind of deed where one can see the distinction between the foolish person and the wise person emerges. Because the foolish person doesn't reflect on that kind of deed, and so he won't do something that's disagreeable. Okay, he, he doesn't do this deed because it's disagreeable, and then he doesn't get the benefit that comes from that kind of deed. Whereas the wise person will reflect and then he'll understand that even though this deed is disagreeable to do, but it's going to be beneficial in the future. And so the person, the wise person, will undertake that kind of action. So we can see this with, say, with many people, you know, when they start meditation, it's not initially a pleasant thing to do. 
unless one has very good roots from past, past lives. But when one sits, one starts getting pains in the body, one gets, the mind starts wandering, drifting, disagreeable thoughts come bubbling into the mind. And so if one doesn't recognize or realize and understand the benefit of this practice, and that it takes patience and diligence and persistence to reap the benefits, then one will think, oh, just pain in the legs, wild thoughts in the mind, this is useless, and gives it up. Discouraged. <laughs> and then there are so many more pleasant things one could be doing. You could be going downtown and going to the movies and going to a bar and drinking and enjoying time with friends. Okay, but if you understand the benefits of this practice, then even though it's hard to do at the beginning, then one will persist, and with persistence, then you reap the benefits. Okay, then there are things that are agreeable to do, but in the long run can prove harmful. So, in this case, so here also, this is where you distinguish between the foolish person and the wise person. So the fool doesn't reflect that this kind of action is enjoyable, pleasant, agreeable, but it'll prove harmful in the long run. And so the fool does that deed and it proves harmful, but the wise person reflects and then avoids that deed, and this proves beneficial. Okay, so we could just reverse the case, and so now one's friends, one's friends call and say, come on, we're all <laughs> going downtown, we're going out drinking tonight, come and join us. And so it might seem that you'll be with your friends, you have a good time, um, I don't know what else will follow from <laughs> It's been decades and decades <laughs> since I did anything like that. <laughs> but you have some idea that in the long run, this is going to prove harmful. And so, if you're wise, then you'll avoid that kind of, those kinds of actions and avoid associating with those kinds of people who go out on the town to enjoy themselves in these worldly ways. Okay, then the fourth kind of deed is that which is enjoyable to do and which proves beneficial. So that's the kind of deed that the Buddha says it should be done on both grounds and then any sensible person will do that because we like to do what's agreeable to do naturally and this will prove beneficial. So the real sort of the test between who is foolish and who is wise are the deeds that are disagreeable to do, but prove beneficial in the long run, and the deed that is agreeable to do, but proves harmful in the long run. So those are the sort of that's the fork in the road where we have to make the right choices, and we can understand who are the people to associate with, who are the wise people, because those are the people when it comes to the crunch, make the right choices. Okay, another sort of ang angle for looking at right association comes from considering what happens to ourselves when we associate with a particular person. This is where that Chameleon type of effect comes into play on our mind and our character. Okay, so the Buddha says that you should consider when I associate with a particular person, suppose the unwholesome qualities increase and wholesome qualities decline. Okay, what is meant by unwholesome qualities? These we could say are unwholesome dispositions of the mind. 
So the disposition towards, you could say, towards greed, sensual indulgence, um, anger, pride, conceit, foolishness, many, many unwholesome qualities, being hypercritical of other people, being tolerant and accept well, the opposite of the wholesome quality is being tolerant and acceptable of other people, being patient, being generous, developing faith in good practices and so forth. So those are the wholesome qualities. So when you associate with a particular person, if the unwholesome qualities start to, you see them gradually and slowly start to infiltrate your mind. Sometimes it doesn't come instantaneously, but just almost slowly and imperceptibly. But over time, you know, it could be like weeks of associating with that kind of person. You see your character is changing over in the direction of that person's character. Then you see that associating with that person is not so beneficial to oneself. Okay, but if you associate with a person and then you see that by associating with that person the unwholesome dispositions of mind start to decrease and the wholesome qualities, the dispositions start to increase, then one should associate with that kind of person. So it's extremely important, especially when we're starting out in this Buddhist path, to associate with the right kinds of people, the people that are going to serve as our Kalyanamita, as our good friends on the path. Okay, but sometimes when people say that doesn't mean that we have to cut off all connection with those people who are um, considered undesirable or inferior to oneself. The Buddha says that you don't cut off all connection with that person, but you say that such a person is not to be associated with, not to be followed and served, except out of sympathy and compassion for that person. So if you think that you have sufficient inner strength to be able to influence that person for the better, then you can associate with that person in order to uplift them. But if you find that that person, that their character is stronger than your own and is pulling you down, then it's better to avoid that person. Okay, then the kind of person to be associated with and followed is the person who is similar to oneself in such good qualities as the sila or moral conduct, concentration and wisdom. And then the person to be associated with and to be followed with honor and respect, that is the person superior to oneself in virtuous conduct, concentration and wisdom. which gives a simile to illustrate the importance of avoiding associating with foolish people and associating with the wise. So there's a kind of grass that is used in India, it's called kusa grass. It's considered almost like a sacred grass. So the yogis, when they make their meditation seats, they make it with kusa grass is considered to have a kind of sacred value. And so here, in this verse, it says, if you take a piece of rotten fish and then you wrap it up in kusa grass, and then later you unwrap the, the fish 
and you take the kusa grass and you smell it, it will give off a rotten odor. I think the kusa grass probably in itself, it has a pleasant fragrance. But when you use it to wrap the rotten fish, then it takes on the odor of the fish. And then there's another substance, it's called tagara. It's a kind of substance that comes, grows on bushes, and they use it to make incense. Okay, now if you take the leaves of a tree, the leaves don't have any fragrance of their own, and you wrap the tagara in the leaf of the, of the tree, and then later you unwrap the leaf, then the leaf will take on the sweet fragrance. It picks up the fragrance of the tagara. And so it's just like that it's just like associating with the wise. Like when you associate with foolish people, then you pick up sort of the rotten odor of their character and their conduct. It seeps into your mind and it influences you. Whereas you when you associate with the wise, then you pick up the sweet fragrance of their character and conduct, just like the leaf of the tree, with no particular fragrance of its own, picks up the sweet fragrance of the tagara, that little flower that they use to make incense. Okay, now, the way I see it, there's a special reason why the Buddha puts right association at the very beginning of the unfolding of the sequence that makes up the Mangala Sutta. And this is because it's associating with the wise that plant in us what I call, or what is called, actually I don't have it here, but it's called the sense of discretion. Okay, what is discretion? It's a very important word that we don't use enough, I say, in contemporary society. Discretion is the ability to make the right ethical decisions. It's the kind of inherent ability to distinguish what is good and what is bad, what is right, what is wrong to make the appropriate judgments, the appropriate ethical judgments. It's a kind of ability, you say. First of all, it's a kind of discernment, the ability to look into a situation and then to assess that situation ethically, to determine, you know, any situation involves multiple vectors, multiple factors. So it's the ability to look into a situation and then assess it, evaluate it from an ethical point of view, particularly when one is faced with personal choices. So the ability to discern, to distinguish the different ethical dimensions of a situation and then also discretion involves the formation of the will, the determination, the ability to determine, to follow one's moral intuitions, one's moral assessments, without being deterred by considerations of expediency. You know, sometimes we make our judgments based on expediency, what's going to be beneficial to me in a kind of material way. What's going to promote my self-interest in the narrow materialistic way. But discretion is the ability to see that there are certain material benefits that will come to me, but those material benefits could have a corrupting influence. And then there'll be certain long-term spiritual benefits that can come to myself and to the people that my actions will affect. And so, it, 
<coughs> Discretion involves those two aspects of moral evaluation, ethical evaluation of a situation, and the directing of the will to follow what one's intuition, one's moral sense tells one is right and good. And to it. We are firmly direct above the considerations of personal expediency, personal benefit in the narrow way. And there are two qualities especially that come to us through associating with the good. So sort of two qualities that enter into this, we call it the moral formation of our character. These two char qualities, the Pali words, are hearing and otapa. What's going on out there? <laughs> Mara has very subtle ways of working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Buddha calls these two qualities, he calls them the bright qualities that protect the world. And then it's difficult to find exact translations for them in, in English. So I've been using moral shame and moral dread, though these have their drawbacks. Maybe you could say for hearing, also you might say conscience, though it's not quite exact also. But this is the explanation. I think this came from some of the commentaries. So it said that moral shame is disgust at bodily and verbal misconduct. It arises from self-respect and induces one to reject wrongdoing based on the sense of one's own inherent dignity. So if one sees an opportunity, say, to engage in some unwholesome action, okay, when I was, <laughs> true confessions, <laughs> when I was a young man. <laughs> I used to go into the bookstore. In those days, I think they didn't have the mirrors in the corners. And I would look around, and if I saw a book that I wanted and it was too expensive for me to afford, I would look around, I would wear this raincoat with inside pockets, Look around, nobody is looking. <laughs> I'm completely out of anybody's range of sight. And being maybe the late teens, very quick of movement. <laughs> and, And then I'm out at the bookstore with the books. Very shameful, isn't it? Okay, but if one has hearing, one considers an act like that is below, it's like a stain on my character. It's going to detract from my own, the sense of my own worth and dignity. And so if I had been properly associating with the wise in those days and I had accepted their influence and then I saw the book that I wanted and it was just too expensive, I would just have accepted the situation 
even though I have the opportunity to take that book, I'm not going to do it. I'll save up my little allowance if I want this, or ask my parents to buy it for me, or just give up the opportunity to acquire that book. Because to steal that book would be some kind of, would make me feel unworthy of myself. It would be like, as I said, a stain on my character, a blemish on my character. So that is the meaning of three. It's not like feeling ashamed. Usually we feel ashamed of something when we do something wrong, and then we realize it afterwards, or somebody points it out to us. But this is something that occurs before the action, when we're considering some action which will be beneficial to us, convenient to us. We see this nowadays with politicians. So often it turns out that they've received illegal campaign contributions because they didn't have the theory, that sense of inner dignity to reject those contributions. Now we see it with the sort of exposures that have taken place through the Me Too movement, that these you know, men in powerful positions are able to sexually exploit or abuse women because they think they can get away with it, and they don't have that theory, that sense of moral restraint that comes from recognizing that even if they could get away with that, if they won't be exposed, it's going to be a blemish on their character, degrading their own character. Okay, so that, that is Hiri. The other sort of counterpart of Hiri is in Pali, the word is otakla, which comes from a verbal root which means to burn, tapati, the verb tapati means to burn. So otapa is a kind of burning <laughs> that comes from the, <coughs> call it the fear of consequences, the fear of the consequences of one's actions. So there are undesirable consequences of unwholesome action, so if one, okay, go back to this 16-year-old boy, 15-year-old boy in the bookshop, okay, he thinks he can get away with stealing the book, puts it in, his, in the pocket of his raincoat, and he didn't realize that there was a mirror in the corner. <laughs> okay, now the bookstore owner <laughs> calls him, Okay, we saw you, <laughs> give back the book, call the police, well, I don't know if they call the police, but... Um, <laughs> okay. Actually, I just remembered something. <laughs> Another, well, I really had a bad character in this. <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm wearing monk's robes rather, <laughs> rather than being in prison. <laughs> okay, this was when I was a little boy. <laughs> and in the corner, they call this like a stationery store, there was in the window, pen and pencil sets. And I think I was five years old, six years old. I don't even really know how to write yet. But I saw the pen and pencil set for like those days, you know, 1950, 51. <laughs> so, like it could have been $1, $2. So I wanted the pen and pencil set so much. And 
I was afraid, I think, to ask my parents, or maybe I did ask my parents and they refused to get it for me. And so one day, my mommy goes out of the kitchen into another room and I see her purse is on the table. <laughs> and so um, I open up the purse, take out a couple of dollars, close it, and down the street in the flash of lightning to the, uh, to the shop. I buy the pen and pencil set, I bring it back, I have it in my room. Okay, then a few days later, I guess my mother was cleaning up the room. <laughs> and then she calls me and I come to see her. And there she is, she's holding a pen and pencil set. And she says, Jeffrey, how did you get this? Um, um, <laughs> Grandma gave me <laughs> Which was a little foolish of me. Because Grandma was living right upstairs. <laughs> okay, so then I hear the footsteps on the stairs. <laughs> then the footsteps coming down more forcefully. <laughs> and then of course she tells me that I just asked Grandma and Grandma says that she didn't give you any money. How did you get the pen and pencil set? So then I had to make the confession. <laughs> there was nobody else that I could put the blame. <laughs> Okay, I don't remember the, the consequences of that, except that I had to give, I think, the pen and pencil set back or do something, I don't remember what. Okay, but one of the consequences is getting in trouble. At that time, because I was just a kid with my parents, the consequences were not very heavy. But if one commits some kind of major transgression, like you see nowadays with, say, a politician gets caught taking bribes, he can be, you know, lose his position. Now with those big powerful men being exposed, they lose their reputation, they get discharged from their position, some get imprisoned and so on. And so there are harmful consequences visible here and now and then in terms of the working of the law of karma, some kind of law that operates below or beyond the threshold of a perception, those consequences eventually come back to us. And so we have to be aware of the consequences of our actions. Uh, this is a, a little sutta which shows us the kind of qualities to look for in the persons that we're going to choose as our friends on the path. So, and here the Buddha, in this sutta, he's speaking to a group of lay people, not to monastics. So he's not saying that you associate with those who are, you know, accomplished in samadhi, in the higher stages of wisdom but just, you know, the level of day-to-day -day associations. So you should associate with those who are accomplished in sadha, 
which is faith in the Buddha sense of faith in good qualities and good practices. Those who are accomplished in virtuous behavior, who live in accordance with the precepts, the guides to moral conduct, who practice generosity and who have wisdom. So you associate with them, have conversations with them, hold discussions with them, and then you should emulate them you should follow their example with respect to their faith, virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom. Okay, then we can skip over this. So this is a very, it's a very beautiful sutra, very beautiful passage, but it goes into more detail than we need right now. But in this sutta, the Buddha is speaking to a young man that he's met on his own travel. And he's explaining to him different aspects of the good life for a householder. And one of them is to avoid false friends and to associate with those who are genuine friends. And then he speaks about those kinds of people that appear to be your friends, but actually if you really look into their effect on your, on your development, they turn out to be foes, enemies. Mm. Uh. We don't have to go into all of the details of this. But and then the Buddha goes on to explain who you can understand to be your genuine friends. So these are some of the good the qualities of, of, the true, <clears throat> of the true friends. The one who is a helper, the one who is the same in happiness and sorrow. Like when you're happy, he shares your happiness. When you are in sorrow, he shares your sorrow the one who gives good advice, and the one who sympathizes. Okay, I think that takes us through the first verse spoken by the Buddha. So, it's 9.35, should we take a little break? I think I had that on the schedule. <laughs>